this uh, presentation. We want to welcome you to this latest edition of this series. The Career Accelerator Lecture Series was begun last fall, uh, fall of 2020. It's an initiative of the Engineering Advisory Board, and its goal is to help you to um, be exposed to some elements of being a professional, a practicing professional that may not be covered so much in our formal coursework. And we've had, we've been excited to present these. I think they've been a real benefit to our program. And we're excited about our presenter today, Mr. Jay Steinmetz of Kiewit. Uh, Jay serves as the Executive Vice President of Operations for Kiewit Power Engineering in Lenox, Kansas. He's been with Kiewit for 28 years and has served in many different roles, including startup manager, project manager, department manager, and more. Today, he has an organizational responsibility of $400 million of revenue and 500 Keywood employees, including design, engineering, project management, and accounting. He's proud to also serve as Keywood's university relations sponsor for the University of Kansas, group leader for Keywood's leading integrated delivery training program, and an executive sponsor for Keywood's young professionals and key women. Jay graduated from the University of Kansas in 1993 with bachelor's in mechanical engineering and business administration. He's also the proud uh, that his daughter graduated as a mechanical engineer from KU this year, and his son is a freshman at KU studying supply chain management. His entire family uh, has KU DNA. And we're glad to welcome Jay Rock Chalk. Um, how this is going to work if you've not joined us before. Um, we want feedback from you. So we're looking for your questions. This is should be highly relatable, so your finance questions. Um, be thinking about those as you go along, enter them in the chat as you go along. Those questions will be seen by me and I'll be com combining those. We'll probably get a few that, that are similar and uh, we'll ask those at the end. Um, so look for the chat, ask your questions, uh, things like what do you do on student loans or what should I invest in first or how do I manage my finances? So as, as we go forward, be thinking about those things with that. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jay and look forward to what he has to say. All righty. So this topic uh, is called Foo Fighting, the Engineer's Guide to Building Personal Wealth. And uh, Foo, I'm going to get into that in more detail in a few slides, but it stands for your financial order of operations. And I'm excited to give the talk because um, I know it's not part of your regular curriculum. And when we have employees start here at Kiwit, I get a lot of the same questions. They're looking for guidance on how do they start investing? How do we start getting uh, some wealth going? So uh, we're gonna start with a quick commercial here. Uh, it's actually 11 years old, so it's a little bit fuzzy, but uh, it really gets to my, my point here. I'm Stanley Johnson. I've got a great family. I've got a four bedroom house in a great community. I like my car. It's new. I even belong to the local golf club. And how do I do it? I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. I can barely pay my finance charges. Somebody help me. All right, so uh, Stanley Johnson is not the only one. Uh, there are a lot of folks that make plenty of money but then struggle uh, with their money. And, and I took this slide from a show called The Money Guy Show. They're on YouTube, I watch them periodically. Uh, and then they got their money, or they got the slide really created from Investopedia and Bankrate. The Bestopedia has been around a long time and I would just say that it's a really good resource. Uh, they do a great job of providing training. If you really need any financial like how do bonds work when the markets go up, that sort of stuff, they, they do a great job. But um, I think some of these statistics were surprising to me at least. So these are individuals making over 100,000, 17% of these individuals can't come up with $400. The, the next statistic sort of blows my mind, 58% of these individuals have credit card debt of at least $2,500. And this is 
the worst kind of debt. This is the not the debt you pay off every month. If you want to have a three thousand dollar credit card bill and you pay it off, it's fine. But if it's revolving debt, you're paying 10, 12, 14 percent interest on it. And the fact that more than half of these individuals have that is sort of beyond me. And then this last statistic, it's kind of the same as the first one, but think of it as one in five people live paycheck to paycheck. And so uh, when I think about Stanley Johnson, I think about somebody that wants to look rich and you know compare themselves to the neighbors, but not really think about building wealth. And what I wanna talk about today is like, how do you build wealth? Um, and I wanna give you a cookbook to that. And, and if you think about what wealthy individuals do really, really well, they save and they invest. And I saw this statistic uh, not that long ago, but it was uh, top 10% of wealth individuals save 37% of their growth, uh, gross income. And that's to say that the reason why they're in the top 10% is because they're really good savers. Um, as I look at the Keywood parking lot out here, you are not going to know who the millionaires are and who aren't. And the millionaires might be that person that's driving a 15-year-old Camry versus the one that's driving a Mercedes. Um, the wealthy people have a plan. They commit to it. They do it every month. They uh, just they have an approach, a habit that they execute. And when the market takes a dump, or something weird happens to them, they already know it's gonna happen. We know that the stock market on average drops significantly every seven years. And they ride through it. They look at that as a buying opportunity and they don't freak out and try to get out. And then finally, uh, I think wealthy individuals are really good at avoiding uh, worrying about what your neighbors are doing. And they avoid the social influences when your neighbor gets a brand new Mercedes or whatever it is, uh, they don't just go out and buy a new, brand new Mercedes. So I think that's what they're good at. And what I really want to stress is this idea of passive in, income. So this graph, um, again, I'm going to get into FOO, uh, this financial order of operation, but this graph is built upon this concept. And the black line here represents what I would call a typical engineer graduating with a $70,000 salary and earning uh, call it 6% raises year over year over year. And that's what you would call your working income. Your passive income, if you can, if you save correctly, you follow through and you invest in index funds in the market are these other lines. If you have a savings rate of 10%, what you see is that if you do it consistently as you move through your career, by the age 53, assuming about a 9% stock return, your passive income can actually assume, uh, exceed your working income. If instead you say, well, I wanna be more aggressive at that and you could, you could uh, find a way to save 30% of your income, then your passive income exceeds your uh, working income at about age 42, 43, something like that. And, it, and then if you continue to work, what you see is that passive income just keeps growing and growing and growing to where it ends up being two times what your working uh, salary is. So it, and the other concept I really wanna kind of explain to make sure everybody understands is that when you talk about savings, I'm really talking about investing in the market, in the stock market. And what you're doing is you're buying pieces of companies, you're buying equity shares in companies. And these companies are out trying to make as much money as they can for their shareholders. So when you think of savings, think of it as buying into companies. And if you buy an index fund, you're literally buying into hundreds and if not thousands of companies. Um, and, and you're getting an equity portion and that becomes your passive uh, income. So another way to look at it is not just your income, but it's also just look at your net worth. And so I put this graph together, call this call this blue line your retirement net worth target. And this is very subjective. You could, it could be, it could be a million dollars lower, it could be a million dollars higher, but I was confident that if I handed you $4 million, uh, you could easily live off that for the rest of your life. Uh, even if you lived to a hundred, 4 million would give you enough for the fund to grow while you're also kind of paying your expenses out along the way. And so, um, what I'm trying to show is that like, if you save 10% of your gross income, you know, about 62 years old, you hit 
that retirement target, and, and this retirement target is ignore Social Security. It it uh, it assumes you're going to live for the rest. Now it assumes you're going to live another 50 years. So again, this this blue line subjective. But look at the difference between a 10% savings rate where you hit it at 62 versus a 30% savings rate where you hit it at say 53. And uh, what happens too is if you continue to work past 53, that just keeps growing and growing and growing. And um, so that's what we're gonna talk about is just, I'm trying to show that the savings rate really matters. And you know we need to find a way to start your career off that way. The other thing I think is interesting is that if you save 30%, it feels like it takes forever to, I mean, it's not forever, it takes 15 years to get your first million. So after 15 years of saving 30% of your individual rate, you can consider yourself a millionaire. But look how quickly you be, it takes to become a multimillionaire just six years later. And what's happening is it's this compounding effect on your passive income just keeps growing and growing and growing. So that million makes, call it 1.1, and then it's 1.2, and then you're adding money to it. So it just keeps accelerating uh, as you age. All right. So this, I'm going to share another video. This one's a little bit longer, but this one really sings to me. I'm, I'm 52 years old. And uh, I got this off YouTube, but Scott Galloway, Algebra Wealth, uh, just listen to it carefully because I think he does a great job of providing some insight on wealth. So what is the Algebra of Wealth? From my experience, it comes down to this formula. Focus plus the product of stoicism, time, and diversification. Let's break these down, starting with focus. People mistake a lack of focus for a lack of talent. Talent and intelligence are correlated with wealth, but aren't as powerful a signal of your future success as determination and focus. Focusing on finding something you're great at, something you can do better than most other people, something that people will pay you for. It may not be your passion, but getting great at something and the accoutrements accompanying that greatness will make you passionate about whatever it is. The second thing you should focus on investing in the right relationships. While this applies to business relationships, the single most important economic decision you will ever make is your partner. Research shows that married individuals experience per person net worth increases of 77% greater than their single counterpart. However, however, marriage is betting half your future net worth that you'll be partners forever meaning divorce is costly. And the best way to hold on to our relationship is not to keep score, bring forgiveness, generosity, and engagement. Or put another way, continue to show up. The next part of the equation is stoicism. One of the chief tasks of a stoic is to determine what is under his or her control and what is not under his or her control. Living below your means is the clearest blue flame path to financial freedom because it isn't your salary that makes you rich, it's your spending habits. Any fool can make money, it's more difficult to hold on to it. As a kid, I thought being rich was having a BMW 2002, Pop Siders, and Varnays. But as an adult, I know better, or at least I know better now. Dispel the myth that you need to be a billionaire to be rich. You don't need to be a hero. I know partners at investment banks that are millions every year, however, between their ex-wives, alimony, homes in the Hamptons, and their fabulous lifestyle, they spend every penny of it. They are poor. And there's my dad. He earns almost $50,000 a year from his Royal Navy pension and Social Security and spends $40,000. He is rich. The most powerful forward-looking indicator of your financial freedom is not how much you earn, but how much you save. Stoics also embody good character. Succeeding in life is a lot easier if people want you to succeed. Many of us have a cartoon image of rich people being Monty Burns. The reality, at least in my experience, is much different. The other stoic virtue relevant to wealth, temperance and discipline. In this age of superabundance, your instincts can lead you astray. Don't let them. The temptations for consumption are everywhere as industrial production and processing power have created a ubiquitous doom scroll. 
an upgrade from economy to premium economy to business class, to first class to a private jet can all seem like an investment in yourself. They are not, nor is watching TikTok videos for hours, constantly checking Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook for affirmation, or looking at the price of Bitcoin seven times a day on Coinbase. We crave DOPA for instinctual reasons, but now it's everywhere and we have trouble modulating. Modulate, show discipline. There's a thick line between investment and consumption. One enhances your economic security and the other gives you a dopamine rush. If you're investing to learn or for dopamine because it's fun, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but recognize, recognize both of those cost money. If you're serious about investing, you should not be prepared nor willing to lose it all. If you invested in low cost index funds a decade ago, you would have outperformed 90% of alternative investment funds. And if you hold a basket of diversified stocks for at least 20 years, nobody has ever lost money. The third element of our equation, time. In the long term, time is your ally. In the short term, it's your enemy. The amount of time we have is completely out of our control. Do not squander it. Time is the one thing you should not be generous with. Invest early and make it a habit. The math on compound interest doesn't lie. Starting early with a little can be starting a little later with a lot. Let's take two people, both invest 4,000 a year. Person A starts at 20, but stops investing at 40. Person B starts at 40, but ends at 65. Earning 10% a year, person A ends up with over 600% more than person B, thanks to decades of additional compounding. Remember, it's time in the market, not timing the market that counts. See above compound interest. Lastly, lastly, diversify. In investing, diversification is your Kevlar and ensures that no one bad decision is a fatal blow. All right, so I called this uh, title, I titled this slide Perception of Risk, but I wanted to just take a few moments and ask a couple questions. I wish we were all in person so I could actually ask you, but consider these questions. Um, what, is it, what is the Dow Jones average at today? And I don't actually know the exact number, but I know it's around 34,000, 35,000. It's been kind of swinging back and forth about 1,000. So today it's at 35,000. Next question I have for you. I graduated in 93. What was it in 1993? The answer is it was around 3,500. So in the last 30 years, it's gone from 3,500 to 35,000. What is the Dow gonna be at when you're 30 years into your career? And I think a lot of people think about it as like, you know, it's going to be 40 or 50 or 60. It's not going to be 40 or 50 or 60. It's going to be 200, 300, 400, 500, 600. It's going to be magnitudes larger. And so the reason why I bring that up is because um, when you think about what you're doing, this is my ride that I wrote. This is the Dow Jones between 1993 and sort of halfway through or the end of 2020. And I was buying along the way. So my question is, I want you guys to just think about it, is if you're, let's say you were a year into your career and you invested $10,000 in the market and the market takes a 30% decline, is that good or is that bad? Well, you're a buyer, so it's good. You may look at that 10,000 and say, well, geez, I just lost 3,000. That was the dumbest thing I could have ever done, but now you're buying at 7,000 and that dollar cost averaging approach will smooth out this entire ride and um, it, I, it will benefit you. I just, I just wanna kind of reinforce the idea. It's like, don't think in terms of years or days or months, think in terms of decades and how this compound uh, return goes. So that was my point about that. The, um, okay, so let's talk about financial order of operation. So, uh, the money guys have a foo. The I think Dave Ramsey has a foo. The I got this from, and I later proved it. I'm going to show you later in a, in a, a spreadsheet. But um, there's a really really good podcast called Stay Wealthy. Taylor Schulte's the host, and this episode 62 
talks about the correct order of savings and investing. And what the idea is with a financial order of operation is you're gonna go through this process, this sorted checklist, and you're gonna fill each bucket until it's full. So you're not gonna to go to step two until step one's done, you're not gonna to go to step three and so forth. So you're literally just filling this bucket because um, they are tax advantages that you wanna fill this bucket before you go to the next one. So, uh, you know, a lot of people don't understand this. So I'm gonna cover each one of these fairly quickly, but enough that you can get the gist of, of what these are and what my personal advice is for some of these. So first off, the emergency fund. The one caveat I have is if, if you have wealthy parents, you probably don't need an emergency fund because they will cover you. They don't even have to be wealthy, but if they have a nice savings, they will cover you. Um, so just think about that. But if you don't, if you're the, like most, uh, you know, three to month, three to six months of expenses and cash is sort of the is sort of the normal thought process here. And the whole idea is if you get laid off, you get furloughed, something bad happens, um, you've got enough to pay your bills, figure out your next step, get you through the next three to six months until you can get another job and that sort of thing. My advice, I would put about 5K in checking, I'd put about 5K in money market. Your checking is just your operating cash. You're gonna need that anyway to pay off bills and that sort of thing. Money market pays a little bit more, but then I think for the emergency, I wouldn't put another three to six months into money market, I would probably go in and buy like a mortgage-backed security fund. Um, that's gonna earn you a couple more percent. I put this graph on here because these are some investments that I own and I kind of zeroed them all out at uh, January of 2020. And so this just shows you that here, here was the price of this one stock and in two months later, it had dropped 35%. So I was looking at just sort of the volatility of what I owned and then here's your uh, mortgage-backed security. So here it is just trucking along. There's some market risk, but you know, it's just earning you just a little bit more than you would in money market. So you're going to fill this emergency fund until you're comfortable with it and you're good. And then you're going to go to the next step. The next step is pay off your debt. And this is, some of this is a little bit controversial, but I would say you're better off striving for zero debt than trying to leverage yourself in other ways. But uh, absolutely no revolving credit card debt. You need to pay off your credit card debt every month. Um, just a real quick story. I took over, I'm a power of attorney for a really close relative of mine. I took over their finances. They really couldn't figure it out. Come to find out they had $35,000 of credit card debt and they're paying 13 and a half percent. And they also had $250,000 of money over here that was in a uh, stock fund. And the first thing I did was I took that stock fund, sold 35,000 of it and created out. If they were paying $5,000 a year just in credit card debt, just to finance the debt, just makes no sense. Um, and I would say, don't buy it if you can't pay in cash, unless it's a house or your student loan that you're continuing uh, with and assuming that it's a low interest rate. And I would say low interest would be kind of less than 3% would be in my mind in a 2% inflation world. Finally, if you need a car and you don't have the cash, just buy an old one, buy one that's 10 years old. Don't lock up a bunch of money into a new car and, and pay for all those financing bills. All right, so once you've got all your debt paid off, you're gonna go to your 401k company match. This, isn't, this is the portion where the company may match your salary. Um, Keywood has a really good uh, program. We, they match or we match up to 6%. And what that does, so let's say you're making 70,000 a year, you put in a thousand, your company puts in a thousand and that lowers your, um, what you call your adjusted gross income by a thousand, which from an IRS standpoint, they're only gonna tax 69,000 instead of 70,000. So if you max it out, if you put 6% toward your 401k company match, again, your company's giving you 6%, and then you're saving, at least in Kansas, you're saving about 750, 800 bucks in taxes. And that's really the benefit of that, that um, of the 401k. Um, so you're gonna fill that up to whatever your company match is. It's not gonna be 6%, it's gonna be whatever the, the uh, who you hire with. Then you move on to the health savings account. I would argue that the health savings account is probably the least known, um, best option out there for you because what it gives you is it it acts like a 401k in the sense that if you put money into your hs health savings account 
it reduces your AGI so it doesn't get that uh, you pay less taxes. And then as that grows, it acts like a Roth and you essentially don't pay any income or capital gains on it. And it just, it's just like money. It's like a checking account. So you put in a thousand, um, it grows, it's worth 5,000 and you just spend it on your medical expenses. And now you, the, the, the trick with an HSA is you, it's subject to market risk. So you want to put some of that money in your HSA into like a money market and then some of it into an index fund. Um, so that it can get the benefit of the market. And then finally, once you turn 65, it acts like a 401k. So it gets taxed at that point, but it, it's not like you have to worry about whether or not you've spent enough money in it. It'll still be there. You'll just have to deal with taxes after 65 if you didn't spend it. Now there is a limit. If you're an individual, the uh, max contribution is 3,100 bucks. The other thing I would say just when you graduate, there's a good chance that you could remain on your on your parents' uh, health um, insurance, and you clearly want to do that. So I would try to stay on my parents' health insurance as long as I can. And I don't know if it's age 25 or 26. I should know that, but I don't. Um, and then at that point, you go ahead and start paying your company's health insurance premiums, and you start investing in this HSA. Uh, and then some companies, Kiwit does not offer an employee stock purchase plan, uh, employer stock purchase plan, but essentially what they're doing, uh, most companies do this. They allow you to buy their individual stock. They give you a discount. So you're buying at a discount. So you're immediately getting something from that. Then there's like an enrollment period and a look back period. So you got to stay in it for a, a, a while and then you can sell it. Um, and this why this, this uh, moves around so much. Um, it's hard to say that it's exactly number five in the order, but, but it, it uh, should be right in there in terms of your next bucket. And the IRS limit on it is 25000 So there's a big chunk of money there that you can put in there. And I would just encourage you to be thoughtful about not putting too much into one stock. You want to be diversified. Then comes along the traditional retirement, or sorry, this goes back to the, uh, now we're to the 401k. So you've already put your first company match in there. Now you're going to try to max this thing out. And again, what you're doing is you're lowering your adjusted gross income. So the IRS sees less of it, taxes you less. And every thousand you put in there, you save 100, 180 bucks in Kansas anyway. Um, taxes are not occurred along the ride, but when you, when you retire, you're paying full income tax on that. So whatever your income is, it looks, it looks like a W-2, you're paying full income tax on that. Uh, but it's still, in the order, this is number six in buckets. And then uh, I'll just talk really quickly about the 529s. That, that's in the future for you. That's if you have kids. Uh, it's really a state program. It looks almost like an HSA in the sense that it lowers your, in, it lowers your taxes, basically your state taxes. And then uh, you avoid paying any taxes on any of the gains. So super awesome. The Kansas 5, 529 program is awesome. They run it really, really well. And uh, you'll be just amazed at, at uh, how well it does uh, as you invest in your kids over the 18 years, assuming you want to do that. And then the Roth uh, is number seven. So there's uh, income limits, but essentially it's you, uh, after taxes, you, you, know, you get your paycheck, you pay the government your normal taxes. After taxes, you put it into a Roth. And then from there to forward, you don't pay any taxes along the way or when you pull it out. Now there are caps, you can only put 6,000 in per year. Um, and once you make over 140, it starts phasing out. And um, I would say, even though it's number seven, I would tell you, as soon as you get your job, go ahead and start a brokerage account with a custodian Roth in there, put 500 bucks in there, it starts the clock, and then you can kind of treat yourself, add some money in there whenever you want. Um, but, but getting the clock started for some of the kind of behind the hand, behind the scenes taxes reasons is a good idea. Then there's a thing called a mega backdoor Roth. We have this at Kiwa, but it's really geared, it's the same thing as a Roth, but it's geared toward high incomers and you can put more money in there. So if you wanna put more than 6,000 into a Roth, this would be your next step. And it's a great program, um, great program. Okay, so deferred comp, I'm not gonna talk about it because we don't have it, I don't know it that well. 
And then really finally the taxable brokerage account. So this is, I think people are afraid of, of the word brokerage account it's so easy to set up. If you go to Vanguard or Fidelity or Schwab or any of these companies, all you need is a checking account. You put, you put your money from your checking account into this brokerage account, and then, it, then they have a fund that you can buy and sell things with. You can start a custodian IRA. You can start, uh, just buy some stock. A lot of times it ties back to your employers. Um, but like if you wanted to do step number one and follow the advice of getting like a mortgage backed security or some other investment that pays more of the money market, you're going to need a brokerage account. But it's so easy to set up. It, it takes 20 minutes. My daughter um, graduated from KU this year. We sat down together. I just she asked for my help. It took literally 20 minutes. So uh, I would encourage you to get that stood up. OK, so I'm going to get detailed on you here for a minute. Um, this, this is sort of me proving out how the math works. And what I want to show everybody is this, this is the idea. So this is, this is foo proven is what I called it. If you have a thousand dollars and these basic assumptions on what you're making and what you're growing, um, let's start with number, uh, so we know how to build an emergency fund. We're going to step two here and you want to pay off debt. The 58% of people that make more than hundred thousand dollars. For every thousand dollars they have in debt, they're paying over a 30 year period, close to $40,000 in interest payments. So that's why it's totally absurd to me when you think of this in learn terms of long term debt, you have to pay that off. And if you think about $2,500 instead of a thousand, you're talking a hundred thousand dollars that you're putting into this debt that's getting you nothing. Um, you know, so absolutely got to pay off your debt. Then uh, the 401k match. So again, this is the portion that the employer gives with you. You put a thousand in, your employer matches it at a thousand potentially. Now it's 2000. You let that grow for 30 years. That's about 26,000. And then you pay income tax on it. So when you withdraw it after tax, it's about 22,000. So that's why the 401k match is clearly number one, because it's better than all the other columns here. Then you move to the HSA. Now, one of the things I did here was I sh I'm trying to show that if you put $1,000 into your HSA, you, you also get this tax savings of $173 in Kansas. So really, if, you're, if, you, if you do your HSA and you put $173 in your Roth, they, they act the same way. And at the end of 30 years, they're worth about 16,000. Same way with the 401k, you take the savings, from your uh, tax savings, you put that into a Roth, let that grow. And again, after 30 years, it's worth 16,000, but you gotta pay income tax on it, which drops it to around 13,000. And then the next one is the 529. And you can see, like just, you can kind of see the math here. You know, you, you it's a thousand after tax. You're only able to put 885, this is gross. So 885 goes in your 529. And this is essentially what you get out of it after 30 years. Now. Doesn't really work that way because your kids probably aren't going to live, you know, they're going to start college at 30, but whatever. Uh, then the Roth is the same. That drops you down to uh, about 11,000 return. And the uh, then I wanted to show, this is just your taxable brokerage account. So, you know, you, you put your money in after taxes, you put it in there, it's 1,000 growth, it's 828 after taxes, you put it in there, pay taxes on that when you pull it out. So it's worth about 9,500 bucks. Now they're, there's a lot more flexibility in these. You know, you can, you don't have to wait till you're uh, 59 and a half to pull it out, whatever. But um, the reason why I wanted to show this was really the um, taxable advisor fund. So I know of quite a few people that have a advisor that selects stocks and index funds for you. They typically pay about 1%. They, I've seen them pay up to one and a half or two when we started or when I started, you could buy these advisors. Uh, they would charge you two, two and a half percent. It was insane. For every 1%, you're losing this amount of value. So if you have a, an advisor, instead of just buying an index fund through a brokerage firm, instead of making 9,500, you're making 7,200 based on a 1% advisor's fee. If you were to pay 2%, this generally drops another two or 3,000. 
if you pay a 2% advisor's fee on your investments, your net worth will drop in half over a 30 year period. So I'm totally opposed to uh, advisors. I think you can do this all yourself. You just got to go get it going, follow this foo and, and uh, away you go. Okay, so just to, rec I don't know, I'm just putting this up here to recap. I would, I would encourage you if you have any more interest in this, uh, go to episode 62, Stay Wealthy, Correct Money, and it'll go through this and he'll put his take on it. Then, all right, so just general investing comments. I just sort of, the, some of this is reinforcing what I've already said, but you are a buyer, you're not a seller. You're gonna be a buyer for the next 30 or 40 years or however long you're gonna work. Market declines are good for buyers, and so don't let them freak you out. Come up with your plan and execute. That means dollar cost averaging, which means all the dollar cost averaging is, is you're gonna buy some every paycheck, every month. You're buying some. That, that way you're buying, a, you're buying high, low, through the age of the market. Absolutely the way to go. Um, and I didn't really talk about index funds with low expense ratios, but you can buy an index fund and all the index fund is trying to do is match what the market is doing. So Vanguard's got like a, uh, I forget what it's called, Vanguard 500 has a, I think it has a 0.08% uh, expense ratio, super, super cheap. And all it's doing is matching the market. So whatever the market does is what you do. And you're not paying um, any advisor's fees on that. This one is controversial. In, I say it's controversial because common wisdom says you should own a portion of your portfolio should be in bonds. And there's a rule. It's more or less the rule of, is 100 minus your age. So when you graduate now, call it 75% stocks, 25% bonds. Bonds are... I do not understand why this common, uh, why this rule or this thought exists because bonds are, they're just awful. I've never seen them do really well. They earn about 20% of what stocks do. When the market declines, they decline, they decline less. When the market rebounds, they rebound less. I mean, you can go to any 10 year period and you're going to see where bonds just don't do anything for you. Now, I think you know, if you only had $100,000 in the bank and you were going to retire next year and count on Social Security, well, then, okay, you need to bonds. But at, at, at 25 years old, in my opinion, you should have nothing in bonds. Everything should be stocks. And you're going to ride this wave. And when the market drops, don't freak out. Just keep going. Um, whatever your retirement number is, it will increase and probably double. So if I said $4 million earlier, you're probably like, that's crazy. I could retire on one. Well, as you get older, the just number just goes up and up. And then I would say my suggestion is save at least 25% pre-tax. I know you can do it. Engineers make a lot of money coming out of school compared to their peers. There's no reason why you can't save uh, a good amount of money pre-tax. All right, just wanted to show this. This, a um, couple other comments too. This is Kiwitz, uh, our options. There's, you can actually get a lot more complex, but they, this is the easy button option. They have these target funds. Target funds are always have higher expense ratios. I would, as soon as they automatically enroll you in a target fund date, because that's what most companies do, I would go in there and absolutely change it to just a US large stock or an index stock fund. Um, try to go for the low expense ratio, pay as little as you can along the way. And then just look at these bond returns to my point earlier about bonds. You know, the Martin, if you look at the 10 year market for these investments, there's, there's years where this will lose 10% or 20% or 30%. But these things just, anyway, I'm just suggesting not to buy bonds. Um, all right, and then I've only got, I think I've got three more slides left. The, so we have an organization at Kiwit called Kiwit Young Professionals. And I gave this talk, I think a year ago. And part of the talk, I actually surveyed everybody on what they were doing on their pre-tax savings rates. And I'm trying to show you that you can save 25%. So of the Kiwit Young Professionals that are in this group, we've got about 100 and I don't know how many now, we've almost got 200 people in it. 33% um, of them were saving between zero and 10%, not enough. But a quarter were between 10 and 20, a quarter of our population was between 10 and 20 and 40. And then we had a few outliers over here that were saving well over 40% of their uh, pre-tax savings. So you can look at this sort of bell curve that I created and you can see that 25% is not out of the ballpark. It's not completely um, unusual. So 
that's my advice. Use this, use these bucketing strategy until you get to 25% of your gross income. And then finally, while I have you, I have two more slides and I just other sort of warnings I just want to share with you because I have you. Um, first off, if you have kids, the first thing people are going to say to you is, oh my gosh, you got to start saving for college, which is true. However, as soon as you start paying for daycare, you, you, there's no way you can even save for college because daycare costs about 10000 per year today, and it could be more than that for all I really know. Um, but it's in that order of magnitude, and you're paying that from the day they're born to the day they go to pre-K. So daycare will just absolutely blow your mind. So have that in mind if you have kids. Uh, never buy whole life or universal life, only term life, and just enough to cover what you want. Um, I bought mine through ASME for the first five or 10 years until I didn't really need insurance anymore. And uh, because they're engineers, it's just, it's just, they're, it's cheaper, very, very cheap. Um, don't ever buy extended warranties, avoid offered upgrades, buy the least amount of insurance you can most of the time, use that savings and build your own insurance fund. Remember that every dollar you don't spend will be worth $10 30 years from now or thereabouts. Uh, I would tell you the more you calculate your, if you calculate your net worth quarterly, calculate your expenses monthly, it will discourage you from wasting money. You'll see how much money you can save. And then we use, I use Mint to track it. Mint's awesome. You just plug all your stuff in there and it'll tell you how much you spend on beer, how much you spend on groceries, whatever. Um, absolutely don't worry about your neighbor's lifestyle. Do your own thing. Be stealthy, wealthy, as I said in an earlier slide. Last slide, uh, pay special attention to subscriptions. So these, these $5 a month thing, well, that's $60 a year. You got a couple of them. Next thing you know, you got a thousand bucks into these subscriptions. Um, Scott Galloway said it in his, but be kinder to your spouse than any other person on the planet. Like just, just do it. it it's just so easy. Uh, don't buy brand new cars, boats, or furniture, or a lot of other things. And the, and the reason is, that's a whole, I, I have another presentation on this, but new cars actually, you know, you buy a new car, it lasts for 15 years versus an old car that may only last like another five or 10. But the difference with a new car is you're locking up 40 or $50,000 more, 30 or 40 or $50,000 more than you were in an old car. So that 30 or 40 or $50,000 could be in the market creating passive income for are you, but it's not because you're paying the, basically the cost of the car and boats and, and uh, are the same, same way. So that's why I'm opposed to new cars. The uh, stop buying stuff, it's all gonna end up in the landfill. Uh, for luxury items, one trick is to imagine owning it for at least a week before you buy it and you are, and I forget what the numbers are, but you're way less likely to buy it after you've imagined owning it. Stop watching uh, these news quote news programs uh spend that time on something you love or want to learn it uh it is so refreshing i got stuck in that trap of watching that and then once i stopped i had a whole bunch of free time that i benefited from uh, my last two pieces of advice adopt a do-it-yourself mentality mow your own yard change your own oil learn how to fix things learn how to do things and then i said it earlier don't hire a financial advisor they just they'll, they'll drain the uh, your net worth out of you. And then uh, to quote my daughter who says this at least once every couple months is travel is the only thing you can buy that make you richer. It makes you richer. And I completely agree with that. Um, life experiences. Um, I've never gone wrong with life experiences. And I back to my other points, I've never gone wrong with, uh, with not spending money on a thing. Um, you know, either waiting it or just not having it. I'm, I've never I've never missed it. So that is the end of that presentation. And I'm going to stop sharing and we can do Q and A, Bob. All right. Thank you, Jay. That was fantastic. We have had a number of questions come in. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of just basic definition questions that we had come in. We had some people a little bit confused. How are you defining passive income? And you may want to say, you know, what, what encompasses passive income? So what I'm, when I'm defining passive incoming, uh, sorry, passive income is 
it's the growth on that stock. So if you invest in a stock, you put $100 in a stock or an index stock fund, that will grow at, call it 9%. So that, I think I said nine, I don't know if I said $100 or what, I, what my denominator was or my numerator it was, but that is the passive income. That is gonna continue to grow. Once you get that money in there, you're gonna earn $9 on that $100 every year over year over year over year. What, what does confuse people sometimes is those stocks throw off dividends and that is not actually in the Dow. There's actually more money that you're getting that I also put in the passive income bucket. So a stock will give you, will pay out dividends and then you reinvest those dividends and that's all part of your passive income. So I've got, um, and, and, and I'm just putting that over a year time frame. So that's how I think of passive income. Okay, um, next one was, what is dollar cost averaging? So dollar cost averaging, um, if you re dollar cost averaging is buying the same amount of stock or the, uh, the same value every month, over month, over month, over month. Now that stock market is gonna fluctuate up and down, right? So the idea of dollar cost averaging is Every month you're going to buy and you don't really look at whether that stock is up or down. You're not trying to time, oh, it's down, so I want to buy a lot. And then it goes up, so I don't want to buy any. And then it goes down again, so I want to buy a lot. Like you cannot time the market. So dollar cost averaging is I have a program that every month, just like your 401k amount, it, every month, that is dollar cost averaging. It buys a certain amount, regardless of where the stock market's at, and it ju you just do it over and over and over. And that way you don't have to worry about timing the market. It's time in the market as that video shared. Okay, uh, does buying the dip ever make sense? It is said you should keep stagnant funds in the market. Time in the market beats timing in the market. And I think you use that quote as well. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't this imply you should never have funds on the sideline waiting to buy the dip? So I guess the question is, are you 100% invested 100% of the time? Yes, you are. And I'll tell you a really good story. And I just heard it last week. So we had a, I, I was talking to a guy at Kiwit. He thought the market was overpriced. He thought he was sort of like, well, Trump's going to do this and the administration's going to do that. And there's going to be an opportunity. He took his money out of stock he told me that he did this this is a year ago the dow was at uh 24,000 so he took all his money because he thought the dow was going to drop from 24,000 and then he was going to re re put it back in because of this kind of theory he had in his mind well guess what the dow is at 36,000 right now and he's now he's like well i can't enter it now because i i'm going to wait for the next dip and so i was like okay you might be waiting 7 years it might happen tomorrow but there's no way to know. There's just no way to know. And the other thing that the business school will teach you at KU is a smart market efficient theory uh, of pricing. So if there's a stock price, half the people think it will go up and half the people think it will go down. Smart market theory dictates that you have no more knowledge than the entirety of the market and it is what it is. And so absolutely, I have never put money on the side thinking, oh, I'm gonna wait for this opportunity. But I'm not a gambler. And I would say that if, if you do have that inkling of trying to like maybe, um, maybe you wanna to try to Tom the market, the, the, the term they use is a cowboy fund. You can create a cowboy fund that's like five or 10% of your net worth. And if you wanna go try these things, that would be my advice is if you want to go into Bitcoin or you want to try to do some other things that maybe there's a lot more volatility, just keep it to a portion that you're comfortable with. And I would say that's on the order of magnitude of five to 10% of your net worth and no more. Okay. Um, how soon after you're out of college should you buy a home and under what conditions should you buy a home versus renting? So that's a good one. So we've had this unprecedented uh, increase in home pricing and since uh, COVID hit and Johnson County has gone up literally 20% in the last two years. So here's, here's the rule of thumb that I would tell you is that prior to COVID, the year in average, the, 
the inflation rate on homes matches the inflation rate on the economy. So if you bought a home 30 years ago, it would have grown at 2.1%. So it's not really an investment. Like don't think of buying a home as like, I'm gonna make a bunch of money. The math will dictate, first off, there's a lot of transaction costs when you buy a home. Okay, so you're gonna pay six or 7% ultimately when you sell that home. What, what that sort of says is that if you're going to be any place for less than call it four years, you should rent. If you're going to be there more than four years about, then I think you should buy. And I, there's just this caveat with everything's going weird with the market, the housing market right now. Um, so it's really anybody's guess as to whether the market's going to decline again on house pricing or uh, it's going to stay here because now there's a lot more teleworkers and et cetera, et cetera. So my rule is, um, you know, if it's less than four years rent, if it's more than four years buy, the other problem with renting is renting just keeps going up with the cost of inflation. So rent next year will be 5% more probably because CPI is going up that much. Um, you know, the other thing I'll tell you, and I don't know the answer to this, but I've heard this is, you know, there's always been this idea of put 20% down. And I don't think that holds anymore when these market rates are going so weird because I know people that saved for years to get 20% down and then the price of the house went up 20% and they're like, I should have just bought the damn thing. And so, um, so I don't know, it's tough, but, but yeah, I, it, and I think the corollary question to this is should you pay off your home early? When I bought my home, I think we were paying seven and a half percent interests for a 30 year loan. And I did some deals where I actually was able to drop that, but it made sense for me to pay off my home. And I got a, a lot of emotional satisfaction out of that. And we did it very quickly. We kind of filled that bucket fairly quickly. And what that allowed me to do actually, without getting too complicated, is that I could buy my next home. That was my starter home. I bought my next home and I had a, basically the same loan because I took all that money and put it in the next home which was great. So I never really had a big uh, expense, you know, every month for that. So, but I think in today's environment, if you can get loans for two, less than 3%, I would say you don't pay off your home. You just go ahead and leverage that and pay your interest rate and you go. That's my opinion. But I do think there's a lot of, um, op not opinion, but it's a lot of preference. You know, do you want to, do you want to be debt free? I want to be debt free, so I pay my stuff off. If you don't, you want to leverage yourself. A home's a good way to do it. Okay, that kind of leans into the next pair of questions, which relate to debt. So one is, since zero debt is a more debated topic, I think you talked about that early on, you took kind of a zero debt position. Is that always right for everyone? And then uh, kind of a corollary to that. Um, oh, now where to go? Um, in the lecture, okay, so you talked about debt being bad, but what about debt to gain ass, ass, access to passive income such as rental homes? So let's say you wanted to invest yeah. in no, land I, or, or a rental property, something like right. that. No, I think that is a good way to do it. I, I in you know, I, I didn't want to complicate my presentation too much, but one thing I would say about a house, one another point about this housing situation, if you're buying a house to live in, the old axiom used to be buy the biggest house you can afford. And I just don't think that's right. Any, and I think it's, you should buy the smallest house you'll be comfortable in for the rest of your life. You don't need a 4,000 square foot home if you can survive in a, or if you can enjoy a 2,500 square foot home. So th that's one thing I would say, but if you're going to leverage to go get investment properties and think of that as an investment, I completely support that. Now somebody else is paying you rent. You had to get that fund to get going. I, I completely support that. So I, I feel like I'm, I may, I may sense like I'm sending mixed messages, but I, I'm not. If you own the house, I, it's different than if you're going to go leverage yourself up and, and get some income that way. Okay. Um, if we have the flexibility to pay for medical expenses from an emergency fund, wouldn't we better off never withdrawing from the health savings account until we turn 65 and treating it solely as an investment vehicle? Yes. So there is an option there. You can actually, um, 
Well, you could do that. And there is a, there's a corollary there that you could actually save your receipts. If you paid out of your emergency fund and you save all those receipts, you can then later on, 30 years later, use those receipts and pay those with your HSA. And so really sophisticated people do that. They have a way of saving all that information and doing that. And so, you know, whether the exact math works out, I'm, I'm not so sure, I, but it is so easy because literally I have an HSA card. I mean, it's basically a debit card, you know? So you go and you pay your bill and boom, there it is. Um, they make it so easy. But I, I think the, the person that asked the question is, is onto something there. And I do think there's benefits to that idea. I haven't personally done it, but I, I'm probably missing out on an opportunity by not having done that. Um, okay. Uh, if you stay on your parents' health insurance, do you have to switch to company health insurance during open season or is aging out of parents' insurance an event that allows change? Uh, I don't know that for sure. I think that would be a life-changing event that would allow you to do that uh, outside of the normal year. But um, I know there's a definitive answer to that. I just don't know what it is. So unfortunately, I can't, I can't answer that definitively. Okay, here's, here's one that uh, I think many of our people will face. I, I remember facing this at one time. There are many shiny companies hiring graduates from offices like San Francisco or Dallas, but the cost of living in those types of cities is so high that it appears seemingly impossible to have a greater than 40% savings rate. Having said that, should our decision-making process for choosing our first job out of college account for the cost of living standards in the location of a given office? You know, I think, I personally think it should. I think you should account for that. I, I will tell you that Midwestern life, like Omaha, Kansas City, um, Wichita, I mean, these are great, great towns to build a lot of wealth. I am absolutely convinced that my net worth would be much, much smaller if I had basically lived in uh, San Francisco or these other cities and even Denver now. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll tell you one quick story is we look at our pay across Kiwit and we basically zone the co co country up. So we have zones one, two, and three. So for example, Omaha is a zone two, which means that if let's say the starting salary was $100,000 for some job at zone three, well then zone two might be $95,000. There's like a sort of an adjustment. Well, Denver, same as Kansas City is zone three. So there are so many engineers that want to go live in Denver next to the mountain, they are willing to take the, the supply and demand of the market dictates that they're not making more. And yet the housing in Denver is roughly double, at least I was out there a couple of weeks ago and we were just on Zillow driving around. I'm like looking at houses. I'm like, that's a $300,000 house in Kansas city. And here it's 600,000. And so the, the, the cost of living there is, I, I think, if, if you want to, this is just, again, my opinion, I would just say that uh, a lot of people that have that high cost of living really struggle to save and build wealth, and they have a lot more debt that they, they struggle with. If you want to go do that, I just think I would model it. You know, I mean, I'm the, I'm the nerdy engineer that likes modeling all this stuff, but once you plug in to $2,500 of rent instead of a thousand here, uh, you're going to go, oh my gosh, you know? And so you're probably going to end up living with somebody else and maybe, you know, in a tiny little, tiny little space. I, I could go on and on about this, but, um, like even Chicago's got a, uh, you know, you're going to pay 50, 60% more just to, just to live there. And the, the salaries don't, they just don't follow and they don't follow the cost of living. They, they're just market-based. I would just add for the extra $300,000 cost of the house, you could take a lot of trips to the mountains living in Kansas City. Uh, Absolutely. Like, <laughs> you know, you can go to Costa Rica, the, the, the uh, oh, I forgot the price, but like a one way flight to Costa Rica is like, I don't know, it's under 300. It's like it's absurdly low amount from Kansas City. There's so many things you can do. Arvin was giving me trouble about going to Mexico last month and this coming month. And it's like, well, it's so cheap. You know, like, anyway, 
Oh, and one other final story. I will tell you this one other story. So we hired a guy from San Diego and he's, he's fourth generation in San Diego. And we were having lunch, uh, this is about a month ago. And I said, Hey, we're just talking. I said, Hey, what, what, um, got any cool trips, you know, set up for your family here in the next, in the summer, what you doing? And he's like, dude, I live in San Diego. We can't afford trips. What are you talking about? And this guy makes plenty of money, like lots of money. And he's even telling me that they don't plan trips because they, they don't have enough money <laughs> left over. So. Um, I would put it in a spreadsheet and do the analysis. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that there's a correlation between living or working in the same city as your parents and reaching net worth goals at an earlier age? So I guess does living near family make a difference on how you say? Well, I've not heard that theory before. It makes sense to me though, because I'll just give you an example is when our kids, when we were doing daycare, my mother-in-law uh, watched our kids on Thursdays. And then, so that saved us over the course of the, that period, that probably saved us 5,000 bucks. I wouldn't be surprised. And then Wednesday nights, we had always had date night. And so it, it increased our chances of staying married over a long term. I love my wife, been happily married for 28 years. But it was things like that where our mother, my mother-in-law would come in and say, you guys need to go have date night and go have fun. And, you know, that can really harm your wealth if you, if you don't stay married. Uh, I think there's a lot of intangibles that increase your net worth that are hard to put your finger on. But I do think there is something there. And, I, and even just the babysitting piece of it, you know, that's how I was thinking about the question. Maybe the question was a different question, but that's, that's how I immediately thought of it when you asked that. Okay, um, two more. I'm planning to start a family early as soon as the situation arises. What is a good game plan? Looking to pay my student loans, work on a mortgage down payment, bit new to financial thought. Well, the one thing, uh, the one thing with kids, I, I think you can follow through. Like, I don't think you need to deviate from the financial order of operations. I think one thing I would say is that it is easy. It's a lot easier to save before you have kids. So, you know, I would get tight with the belt buckle in terms of the, you know, if your target is 25%, well, maybe you make a 30% savings rate until you don't have to. The thing about the 401k and the Roths, I, I didn't go into the details for there, but if you put money into a Roth IRA, you can pull those contributions out anytime you want tax-free there's no penalty the government has already recognized you've already paid taxes on it the, the the dollars that grow you cannot pull out but um so there's flexibility there the other thing is with a 401k if you put a bunch of money in 401k you can pull money out of there to put money on a down payment for a house if you want really penalty free now you have to have a plan to pay that back but there's a lot of options in some of those things um so but I go back to daycare. Daycare is a son of a gun. And uh, you're just going to have to really tighten your belt. And I think when you do daycare, instead of saving 25%, you're going to be able to save 5% or 10% uh, and just get through that period. Okay, we've hit five o'clock. Uh, a lot of great questions. Great presentation, Jay. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I'd, I'd say applaud, but uh, it's kind of hard to do that on Zoom. Right. But anyway, thank you again, Jay. And uh, good deal. No, I appreciate it. And thank I, you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, and thanks to the uh, advisory board for sponsoring this series and uh, getting this off the ground. We think it's uh, it, it's been great for for the whole school. So with that, uh, have a good evening, everybody, and we hope to see you next semester with some more editions of the Career Accelerator Lecture Series. Have a great night. Good deal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.